All right, I think we are ready to get started. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this talk. I hope you're all excited to hear about VB. No? Ooh. All right, we're going to talk about C-sharp 8 and beyond. That pretty much means that we're going to talk about features coming to C-sharp 8, 9, 10, 11. Who knows? Most of the features that I talk about are things that their Microsoft are working on. Who knows when they're going to add those to the language. Some of them are going to make the cut to C-sharp 8, but I can't promise which ones. But I do have a few of them running in Visual Studio 2019, so we'll have a look at that as well. I'm Philip Eckberg. I'm a Microsoft MVP. That just means that I go around to conferences to talk about all these amazing features. I'm not employed by Microsoft, so I can pretty much say whatever I want about them. Uh, you can ping me on Twitter if you have any questions afterwards, or just come up to me after the talk. So C-sharp over the years have kind of evolved a lot. We've had all these amazing features added to the language. We've seen features coming in the early days, such as generics. I know a lot of languages it took a long time to get them into their languages, like Java and, and other great languages out there. It took a long time before they got generic support. But that was kind of one of those things that were in the early days of C-sharp. And then we got things like uh, pattern matching and Lambda expressions and link. And all of that is now packed into this C-sharp 7.3, which we're up to now. And we're going to talk about all the features that are pretty much coming after that. I'll give a quick run through to uh, the C Sharp 7 features as well that we need to know in order for us to understand some of the uh, tougher ones in C Sharp 8 and beyond. So how come that we've gotten so many features into the language over the years? It pretty much is hard to add lang language features to a language that has evolved over the years so much and with a compiler that's so old. The compiler for C Sharp is almost, let's say, 15, 20 years old. I don't know when the first language was out. So the first version of the compiler was written in C++. Nowadays, they build the compiler in, in C Sharp. They did a project called Roslyn where they rewrote the compilers into C Sharp. They used the old compiler to compile the new compiler. And nowadays, they use the new compiler to compile the even newer compilers. That's a mouthful to say, right? So they're now able to add all these amazing new features like pattern matching and string interpolation and all these really great things to the language with the help of Roslyn. And what they do is that they do all of this in open, in the open. So they do this on GitHub. They have this page with the language feature status where you can go ahead and see all the status for the different language features. So this is my avatar up here. So I've actually contributed to the compiler. I did this huge effort by going into this page here and fix a spelling mistake. <laughs> so. I feel really proud about that. Now, so you can go here and check the status of these language features. What's interesting is that they've had this page for a really long time. They've talked about C Sharp 8 for over a year, and they just keep adding features to the list. They don't finish any features. They just keep adding new ones that they want into the language. So part of me thinks that they might never release C Sharp 8. Uh, it'll just keep incrementing on the, uh, the minor releases of C Sharp 7. But we'll see about that. So you can go ahead and, and check this out. But not only do they do the, the language status pages and talk about the features, you can also contribute to the actual compiler yourself. So if there's a particular feature that you really love, you can go ahead and implement that yourself. And I've seen com community members do that. They've had the capabilities of both adding it to the runtime in .NET Core, as well as adding the language support in the c -sharp compilers. And of course, you can also do the VB stuff, but no one uses VB anymore. I'm sorry if you do. Uh, I know a lot of people do use VB. I just like to joke about those people. So C Sharp 8, uh, there's another page called the C Sharp 8 Candidate. So just to make it even more confusing in the traditional Microsoft manner, they have this other page called the C Sharp Lang repository on GitHub, where they list all the C Sharp 8 Candidate features. These are all the champions that they want to add into the language. So again, they have another place where they put all the proposals for language features. So you can see here that they have, uh, for instance, static local functions. Don't know why you want to do that. They have params of span of t and so forth. There are a lot of things in here. The improvements to pattern matching, the improvements to tuples, everything is in here. So what they do is that they have these internal design meetings where they talk about all the features that they want to add to the language. Or people contribute to GitHub and say, hey, I want this feature in the language. They bring some really smart people together, talk about these features, and then maybe people like it or not. Um, a lot of these issues have a lot of comments, so you're going to get um, really hard to follow along sometimes. But you can contrib contribute here as well. 
And if you have really good eyes, you'll see here that on the top, it says the release date of C Sharp 8. It's due by January 1st, 2080. I do wonder if this is, you know, the, uh, in the pace that they're developing the language. This will be released uh, probably when I'm dead. So I'll have a few more conferences to go through <laughs> to talk about all the amazing features that they're adding to the language. Now, all joking aside, they are actually adding C Sharp 8 to the next version of Visual Studio. And I do believe this is the new logo for Visual Studio 2019. Has anyone tried the new preview? Oh, wow, almost half. That's great. So have you tried the C Sharp 8 features as well? No one? That's awesome. So, so in Visual Studio 2019, we'll get .NET Core 3.0, which have a lot of great improvements to performance and a lot of our other amazing things. And we also get the support for working with C Sharp 8. So in C Sharp 8, we'll get things like uh, deconstruction, we'll get recursive patterns and the switch expressions and ranges and nullable reference types and a lot of other amazing things. So I'm going to go into Visual Studio. I'm going to try and stay out of PowerPoint for a while. And before we go into C Sharp 8, I just want to show two features from C Sharp 7 that kind of are improved in C Sharp 8. But if you have no ideas about what tuples are, it's real hard to follow along with these other examples. So this here illustrates a method which returns two things. It could return more than two things. Uh, it's for the lazy people that don't like to write classes or structs. So I can say, well, I want to return three things. Now, this will break everything else that I have in my program, an example here. So I'm going to go ahead and undo this. But this here illustrates that we can create something called a tuple. A tuple is just like a container of multiple different values or fields. So in this case here, I can simply say, well, I have this construct of a type. It has these three different fields, and I can populate that based on these different values. Um, and we can also do other things, like we can compare tuples, right? So we could do like, like this here. And that will, of course, return a Boolean, but you get the point, that we can do all these amazing things with tuples. So you'll see here at the bottom, I have this main method. I'm just going to undo this here so we don't get any other problems. Uh, in my main method here, I simply call my get point method, and this returns this tuple. Now, what happens here is that I can call this on multiple different ways. I could have said uh, var point is equal to get point, and this would simply give me the, uh, the tuple access, and you'll see that I can access the different fields on that tuple that's returned, and it's strongly named as well, so I can get the x and y. Traditionally, with tuples, you would get item one, item two, item three, and so forth. So we can work with this in many, many different ways. We can say that this uh, tuple that I get returned here, I want you to deconstruct that into something that looks a little bit different. So I have this point variable here, which has two fields called x and y. And it takes the, the return values from get point here and puts that into those two new variables. Now, what do you reckon happen if I change these ones up here? What happens if we do this? What happens if I swap these two here? A part of me imagines that, well, it would probably look at the naming, but it doesn't. So what it does is that it actually takes the first match, right? So it takes the, the first value and puts it into the first field, takes the second field and puts that into the second one. So this here would just create the, the most annoying bugs, right? Because I've swapped out x and y. So don't do that. Then we have another way of deconstructing this. So this is called deconstruction. So what we can do here is say, well, I want to uh, deconstruct the tuple that I got into do these two different fields. So we can say, can say that I have x1 and x2 and y, y1 here, x1 and y1, and it's deconstructed into those two, two different variables. And then, of course, we can do it a little bit more simpler. In this first example, we're saying int twice. Why do we have to do that? We don't want to be repetitive. So we can say var x2 and y2 is equal to get point. So, so this is tuple. This was added in C Sharp 7. Hopefully, everyone has seen this before. If you haven't, um, it's something new for you. Now, this here kind of is coupled together with pattern matching that's coming in C Sharp 8. We already have pattern matching, but it's kind of a really like minor version of pattern matching. So pattern matching that was added in C Sharp 7, in this case here, uh, I have this abstract class called shape. I have two different shapes, you know, the, the deal, uh, a triangle and a rectangle. And now, what if I want to say 
based on these different types, I'm going to run different things in a switch statement. Traditionally, you'd have to do some really ugly code to do that. And in this case here, let's imagine that I get my shape out of some method. So I have this local variable called shape. We know that this is the abstract type. And then we run this switch, switch statement based on the type that I got. So this here is running a pattern matching to see, is it a triangle? Is it a rectangle? And based on the different type that it is, I can then access those different properties and, and methods inside this, this context here. So I could say t dot a, b, and c. And then for the rectangle, I'd have width, height, and um, x and y. So we get the strongly typed version down there as well. Now, previously, you'd have to uh, cast that yourself. And the code just got a little bit ugly, right? So this is kind of pattern matching. Uh, Super simple. Now, to make it a little bit more confusing and to make it even more powerful, in C Sharp 8, we get something called recursive patterns. We get switch expressions. And we get a whole lot of more things that makes pattern matching a lot more powerful. So again, we have, this, we have this shape here. It's a little bit changed. We also have a point on the base class. And then on each of the different concrete types, I've added something called a deconstructor or deconstruct, sorry, not to be confused with the deconstructor. The deconstruct here allows us to say how this object will be deconstructed into a tuple. So I can say here that whenever you deconstruct the triangle, it's going to give you an A, B, C, and A point. And the same goes for the rectangle. So you'll see soon how this works. And the same goes with the point. We have a deconstruct for that as well. Now, when we use this with the new, uh, new things in C Sharp 8, you can see here that I've kind of switched up my switch statement a little bit. I'm now using something called a switch expression. You can see here that this method called compute here takes a shape. It returns a string. The idea here is that I'm going to return a string based off my shape. If you've do, done any Kotlin or Swift before, you probably recognize the ways that you do pattern matching. In Kotlin, you would say uh, return shape where it's something, right? In this case, you say return shape and do a switch. And this here runs a switch um, different cases. Instead of writing case each time, you have these different expressions. So you say, well, when the, the, um, the case is a triangle, we're going to capture that as a local variable. And then we have this other expression here saying when the two sides are not equal, it's going to run this expression here to the right, right? Pretty simple. And then we have other ways of doing pattern matching that are recursive. So we can first check the type, and then we can check other things on that particular type. These are called different things. So we have tuple pattern, positional pattern, property pattern, and then the default pattern as well. So let's check the tuple pattern. Now, in this case here, what I'm saying is that whenever I get a triangle, and I can deconstruct this triangle into a particular um, layout, so to say, whenever I can get A, B, and C, as well as getting a point where I don't care about the X, it's going to run this block here. So imagine that we could say that I want a triangle, but I don't really care if it's a, a point or not. I, don't, I, I, don't, I only want the triangle where the point is null. So this works because we've implemented the deconstruct. Right? But in this case here, I, I want to make it a little bit more confusing. So first we say match on the pattern here, and then it's going to recursively check the, the nested patterns as well. Then we have the positional patterns. These also use the, um, the, the deconstruct. So it checks that it's a triangle, uh, a rectangle, sorry, and then it checks that when the tuple is um, deconstructed into these different values, it makes sure that the, uh, the first Property, property that would get out is zero, and then the next one is zero, and then I don't care what the value is for the last one. So for instance, if we run this with a rectangle, let's change up the code a little bit, new rectangle. So to match that particular pattern, we would have to say the, um, the width is zero, the height is zero, and it doesn't really care for the, the point. And I know this because if we check the rectangle, you can see here that in the deconstruct, the first uh, parameter is the width and then height and then point. So we can simply say that the two first ones need to be 0. And if I run this, it should say 0.0. .0. 
If it doesn't, let's just imagine it does. Right, so that's a 0, 0.0. Great. First line demo didn't fail. Great. So the next one is property pattern. Now, this one here allows us to match for a particular property or, or value, right? So I can say, well, when it's a rectangle, I want you to check the property width and make sure that it's 100. If you want to compare different properties, you would use the first one where you say, well, when it's a triangle, then also add this when block here where you can compare different things. This here is called a property pattern, and I can add more things here as well. And then we can match against any rectangle by simply saying, well, well this is a rectangle, just give me that, this, this case here. And of course, it goes from top to bottom. So the first one, it matches. It takes that one. It doesn't go further down. And of course, in this expression here to the right, we can use and leverage that variable that it captures, right? So I can do r dot height, point, and width. And then instead of saying the default keyword to uh, capture a default pattern, you have this underscore here, which is kind of I don't care. Right, so that's, that's the improvements to pattern matching in C Sharp 8. Now, next up is ranges. Ranges is a way for us to um, work with sets of data. So imagine in this case, I'm using a few other features. I can't remember if span of, of T was introduced in C Sharp 7, 7.1, 7.2, or 7.3, but it's one of those things that they introduced, which allows us to reference a particular set of memory. So instead of using a list of, of int or an innumerable int, I can say I want to point to this particular memory, which in this case is a, um, an array of integers allocated on the stack. And then I can use things like slice here to say I want to slice this up. Give me everything from the fifth element towards one from the end. So this thing here, this is the ranges. This was added in C-sharp 8, or will be added in C-sharp 8. And this allows us to very effectively work with sets of data, because this doesn't copy the array that we have. Since we have the span of int here, or span of t, it doesn't copy any data over to a new structure. It just references that particular part of the memory. So if I run this here, hopefully this works as well. It gives us 5 to 9. And then I can, of course, change this and say, well, give me everything towards run from the end. All right, so that works as well. I believe there are other ways to, to, uh, to work with this as well. They have these crazy um, patterns for specifying the ranges. So we can do a lot of things here with the ranges. And this here is also known as an index. So in order for, to make this work, I had to bring this thing into the, uh, to the project, which I believe will be included in the framework uh, going forward. But just to make this uh, ranges syntax work, I had to bring that in. All right, so this will be introduced in C Sharp 8 and allows us to kind of effectively work with collections of data. I think that's pretty great. Uh, then the next kind of big thing that we're getting in C Sharp 8 is a way for us to kind of avoid getting null reference exceptions. So I, I bet everyone in here has had a null reference exception. Now, what they're doing in C Sharp 8 is kind of stepping back a little bit because they regret adding nulls in the first place. I understand why they do that because nulls are really evil. And someone did like some math on how much the null reference exceptions has costed the world. That was a lot of money, uh, too much. So what we can do with this, um, with the null reference types, is that we can say, I have a string here which is nullable, and I can do this for anything. So in this case here, why do I have to specify that this reference type is nullable? Reference types are, in fact, by definition, nullable from before, right? But in this case, they're kind of turning it around. So they're saying everything is non-null, unless you specify that everything for everything that you want to be null. So in this case here, I can say, well, I want name to be null for some, some reason. But most of the time, you don't want that. So if I remove the question mark here, you can see that we get some squigglies for a person here. And it now says, well, you have a non-nullable property called name, and you haven't initialized that. So you should probably go ahead and do that. And then you can turn on. Uh, warnings to errors in Visual Studio, and everything that could potentially break, will uh, it, it'll let you know, right? So let's uh, let's break this. Let's make it a little bit more fun. So we have this method called print here, which takes a person, right? Person is a um, is a reference type, but since person in this case cannot be null, we don't have to worry about that. But since 
the compiler now knows that name can potentially be null, we can say, well, if it's not null, don't go ahead and get the length. So this here would, would print null if uh, the name here is not initialized. And then we can also say, like you can in Kotlin, but um, in Kotlin, it's an ugly syntax because you have to do two bangs. In C-sharp, you just do one, which is a lot better. It's all about saving the characters. So in this case, I can say, well, I promise that name is not going to be null. So go ahead and give me the length. And this also gets rid of that problem. Now, what happens up here if I say, well, I want to call this method. I know it's not allowing me to, to pass something. Well, it's going to tell me that you should probably not pass null here, right? It's going to tell me, well, null is uh, probably not a good idea to pass here because this expects a, a non-nullable object. I can promise that null is not null, and then the compiler goes away. That's great. <laughs> then we have all kinds of weird problems. Right? I can make fun of the, the team all I want. None of them are here. Are here. So this is great. I think this is, this is a good addition to the language, because this will allow us to quickly see if we have any problems, right? We can, we can turn these into compiler errors, and or during compile time, we can get errors telling us that, well, you should potentially fix this, because it can cause null reference exceptions. It won't catch everything, and you'll have developers doing the bangs everywhere to say, well, I know that this is not going to be null like we know in the first place, right? No one ever wants a null reference exception. So the nullable reference types are a great addition to the language, and I think that um, they're long overdue. So the next one that I can show you is using declarations. They're, uh, for some reason, they figure that people don't want to uh, use their things that they want to use in the using blocks inside the using blocks. They want to use them everywhere in your methods. So now you can simply say, well, using var client is equal to new HTTP client, and it'll be disposed when the method has ended or the context has ended. So if we introduce uh, an if block here, for instance, like this, it should, of course, dispose, dispose of that at the end of the if block, right? I believe. I haven't tried this out, but it should work. So it's all about cutting down the characters. So this is a small addition to language, but it kind of shows that they can add a lot of new features into the language just because they've done all these uh, magic with rewriting the compilers. OK, so the, the last one that I can show you in Visual Studio, I have a, a few slides with features from GitHub as well. This is the async streams. Now, a way for us to work with streams of data. Imagine that you are querying a database and you get everything uh, in chunks of data, or you're reading something from disk, you're getting chunks of data, and you want to process each, each chunk as you get it, right? You've been able to do that before, but the syntax now in C-sharp 8 gets a little bit more interesting and a little bit easier to understand as well. So in this case here, I call something called get async. Now, they don't re recommend us calling things async anymore because it's kind of a Hungarian notation, so everything should just be named uh, for instance, in this case, it should just be named get, like this. That's just a little point. So in this case here, we're calling get here or get async, and we get some data back. But this data is kind of a, a stream of data, so it's an enumerable, but it's going to give us chunks of data. So we can apply the uh, await keyword inside, in front of the for each, which will kind of convert this into saying, well, get each item asynchronously, and when you get the item, it runs the, uh, the code inside the for each. Does that make any sense? Let's look at the code for get, get down here. I have this for loop. This for loop will run from 0 to 100. It'll yield return, which means that it'll return a value as it's available. Each value will be awaited for. It takes 300 milliseconds to get each value, and then at the end of that, it'll return i. That's totally confusing. It's, I'm sorry, I wrote this code. It's the only code that I wrote in the project. And it's totally confusing. You'll see here that it'll stream this out to the console because I write this out inside my main method. Does that make sense? So up here, we say await for each. And for each item that I get in the stream of data, I'm going to print that out to the console. This is not going to block the interface if we did this in WPF or you know, Xamarin or whatever. And then we can do this magic down here as well. And all of this is because I've marked this method as async. I'm using the iAsync enumerable and not the normal iNumerable. And then 
it just works together, right? So kind of a great addition to the language. So that's all the features that I can show you in Visual Studio. So this is kind of the things that we can promise that they're going to add to the language. But remember, when I remember when C Sharp 6 came out, they promised record types and I had a working copy in Visual Studio of record types. And it's still not available, so who knows? They might still pull these features out, right? Don't take anything for granted. So C Sharp 8 is coming hopefully soon. I know Build was just announced. It'll be in May, I believe. And they normally release Visual Studio when Build's around. So hopefully C Sharp 8 will be around somewhere around May. So we're also getting more features that they're talking about and that they've promised. So we'll see how, how that goes. These are the ones that I've seen marked as completed on GitHub. So there's one thing called target type new expressions. This here, I believe, requires a runtime change. So this will be dependent on .NET Core 3 or the newer .NET framework. So in this case here, we don't have, in the, in the first case here, we don't have to say triangle is equal to new triangle. We can simply say new here, and it'll just figure out what's on the left here. Super handy. It's all about cutting the characters. I believe uh, Scott Henselman said something really smart once. He normally says smart things, but this was something that stuck with me. He said that uh, we only have a certain amount of keystrokes in our lives, so we should make sure that we, we save up on them, right? So they hire people at Microsoft to write the keystrokes for us. I think it's great. So an example of this is, is this dictionary here, where we have a dictionary of string off list int, and I can simply say new here, and it'll figure out which type it is. So that's kind of magic, and as well as the, uh, the, the inner ones here as well, it'll just figure out which types this will be. So I think it's good. It's a nice addition, right? So it'll just figure out which types to create here. And then one more thing to save down on the characters. They've uh, allowed us to do, uh, since I believe C sharp 7 point something, we can now say uh, triangle T is equal to default without having to do default and then parenthesis triangle. So they're allowing us to do this in deconstruction as well. So we can say, well, in this case here, I want to initialize age and name with the default values. But now they're cutting down the characters and just saying, well, you could just say default and it'll just figure out what the tuple is. I don't believe I will ever use this, but it's a great addition to the language. Now, something that I will use is something called the generic attributes. If you've ever created your own attributes for anything, be it in ASP.NET or in whatever application you work with, you've kind of been baffled with the fact that you can't do generic attributes. So we had to do something like this, where you say, well, I have my custom attribute. The constructor takes a type parameter, and then you just do a lot of nasty things to figure out the type and so forth, right? No more of that. Now we can actually do generic attributes. So it'll cut down a little bit of code. It'll make it easier for us to uh, work in a more type safe manner. And I'll share all these slides later on. And you might have noticed that I have references down here to all the issues on GitHub where they talk about the language status and the implementation. And if you want to go ahead and, and uh, implement this yourself, you can jump on and help out. Another thing that they're adding is something that I believe people working with logging frameworks or doing a lot of logging we like. In this case here, they're writing something called the caller attributes or caller expression attribute, which allows us to say, well, we have this uh, parameter here called message, and I just want you to fill this out with the particular condition that's used when calling this method. So what happens is that we can, if we have this on assert, for instance, in debug, we can say, well, debug.assert arrays not equal to null, and it'll just figure out that the string here will contain this as a string. So it'll just convert that into this code here. It's a nice addition, but it, you know, it, it makes a lot of sense. And it makes us, uh, it's kind of helpful if you're building logging or doing logging, right? Now, the next feature is something called enhanced usings or pattern-based usings. So they're taking this approach where they're looking at a, a particular pattern, not a pattern as in pattern matching, but they're looking at What's the structure of your type? Do you implement this interface? And then based on that fact, you can do certain things. So in this case, for instance, I have this method called dispose. I don't implement idisposable. Who knows why? I could just implement idisposable, and this would work out of the box. But now I can say var resource is equal to new resource inside a using block, and it would call dispose at the end here automatically without me having to implement idisposable. 
So imagine they're doing this for, for other things, right? I would like to see this, like in, I think, believe Golang still does this, where you can pass anything into a method as long as it implements the particular members or implement the particular methods. So without me having to explicitly say, well, I implement this interface, as long as I implement the methods, I can call that with my type. That would be great. I do believe a lot of people don't agree with that, but I think it's a pretty cool addition. And this kind of shows that they're trying to do something in those lines. So they're doing all, all these different crazy things. They're trying these uh, pattern-based usings, and they're also trying to do default interface methods which is another crazy feature that I'm not really particularly sold on. Now imagine that you're working on um, a project where people can download your NuGet package and implement your interfaces. A lot of the time you might want to update that interface. You don't want to always have to rely on your user to not have to update, right? You don't, you don't want to have to be backwards compatible all the time. So in this case here, I have this iAuthenticate interface, for instance, which only has a user authenticate method. My user goes ahead and downloads this project from NuGet and then implement my iAuthenticate interface. Now, a few years later, when async got around, I also wanted to add the authenticate async method. This becomes a little bit problematic because now, as my users download this with the previous version of C Sharp, it was, this would break my app, right? I, I wouldn't be able to update to the latest version without this breaking my application. Now we can add default methods here instead, to say, well, the default implementation for this is to just return the default from, for a task of, of the user. Now, this would mean that without me having to do anything in my application, I could call auth.authenticate async, and that would just work in my application without me having to implement this. Now, so what's the problem with this? The problem is that this kind of allows us to do multiple inheritance without the particular case of, we, we don't have the, um, the state of the classes like we do in C++, but it's still the same thing. Imagine people adding a lot of in implementations in different interfaces. You just implement all of them, and then all of a sudden you get multiple inheritance. It's a great addition, but I think uh, it's a little bit dangerous as well. But someone smarter than me figured this out, so I guess it's good enough. And then again, they're trying to work around null references and, and a, an easier way for us to avoid problems when we're working with nulls. So maybe in C-sharp 8, we'll get something that allows us to um, do null coalescing assignments. So um, this here would convert into a simply allowing us to say, well, unless, uh, it, unless x is null, just assign that to y, uh, I do believe this kind of gets a little bit confusing as well. If I would occur, like, uh, if I would see that in my application without knowing this particular feature, I would probably be very confused about what this did. But it's kind of the, the thing with all these different features, right? They're really confusing. So what about more things? These are kind of the, the features that they're talking about adding to C-sharp 8, but they have a huge backlog of features that they want to add to the language. They want to add even more things into the language, maybe in C-sharp 9. I believe they're going to skip 9 and just call it C-sharp X, but that's another talk in its own. So what's next? What's happening after C-sharp 8? Well, don't be sad if the things that I just showed you are cut from the, the language, nor do you take anything that I say from the next point on, like something that's coming to the language, because I don't know, and Microsoft don't know. Kind of depends on the people implementing the features. So they might want to add something called negated condition if statements, just to make it easier for us to not have to write this code here. So if not JP is triangle, which is kind of a really hard way of expressing ourselves, so they want to make it easier for us to express ourselves. You want to read an application from top to bottom, and you certainly want an easy way to read the code as well as explain it. And this here doesn't really explain what it's doing. So what about if we can say, well, if shape is not a triangle, that would make a lot of sense. Or if not, I don't like that at all, but if not shape is triangle, which is the same as this one, but we're skipping the uh, two parentheses, so we're skipping two characters. Or we can say, unless shape is a triangle. But then adding more keywords into the language, I don't know if that's the, the best approach, but they're talking about adding one of these here, and I think they've gone back and forth towards which one of them to add. Now, to make it even easier to work with nulls, again, they want to do a null conditional awaits. 
So instead of having to say, well, if my task is not null, then await the task. You can simply say, well, bang, task is not null, just await that. But I think they're going to revise this as well, because this, according to what they've done with the language so far, this doesn't really correspond to the, uh, they should probably do await question mark instead to make it more sensible, but, you know, someone smarter than me. Then they're going to probably add record type. So this is probably one of my favorite features that I'm never going to see in this language. So imagine that we have this boilerplate code that I showed you earlier. I have this triangle of shape, and I add all these boilerplate code, I add my deconstruct, and I add my all of these different properties. What about if I can simply say, well, I have my triangle here, and it requires me to specify these different properties or fields. That would be great. And then when I do that, it generates all this code, which, is, which would be excellent, because this here requires me to specify the different fields or properties when I create my triangle. It also gives me the equality, which not only checks the, you know, each value, it doesn't check the references, which is great. And then, of course, I get triangle width, because everything from this point onwards should be mutable. So we should never work with things that are potentially changing, because that's not really a good thing in a concurrent environment, right? And everything nowadays is working to multiprocessor and concurrency and all that. So we get this with method here, and keep that in mind, because this is what kind of makes it hard to implement this feature. And then we get the deconstruct as well. Now, the reason that this is really hard to implement is because of inheritance. So what happens if we have two different immutable types, and they inherit, you have a new type that inherits from both of them, or one of them, right? It becomes really hard. So how do you implement with here if it's an immutable object? Well, it's, it, it gets really hard. Might be easy on paper, but then when you try to implement this, well, it gets really hard. And that's the reason that it's not been added to C Sharp 6, which they promised or they talked about, because it's one of those things that you really want this for pattern matching. It will just make everything so much easier. Because no one's going to write all that deconstruct code themselves. That needs to be out of the box. It needs to be just generated, right? Otherwise, it becomes really noisy. And of course, they want to make changes to how we declare variables. So this here, uh, I ran into this issue, or not an issue, but I ran into this a while back, where I had this while loop, and I had to iterate over a few things. And I really don't like that I have to declare the character above my while loop here. So in C Sharp 10 or X or whatever, you'll probably be able to do this inline, just like you do with the, uh, the var out when you're calling things with an out parameter. Just becomes a lot easier. And the code becomes a little bit more readable as well. Now, I think this is the last feature that they are proposing for now, um, but I haven't checked in a few days, so there might have been 10 more, who knows. Dictionary literals is a way for us to uh, make it a little bit easier for us to uh, declare our, our dictionary. So this is a way that we can do it today, but it's kind of explicit. Do I really have to say that this is a dictionary of string and int when I can just look at these different types? Wouldn't it be a little bit nicer if I could say, well, this here is a something that allows me to have a key and a, a value, and it would just figure out that this here is a dictionary? You know, I think that would be a great addition. So C Sharp is kind of turning into all the, all the other different languages out there, stealing features from Kotlin, Swift, PHP, Java. Well, probably not Java, because has an update in a few years, but all the other ones. <laughs> Just kidding. So they're also adding things. And the reason that I don't have examples for this is because I'm not smart enough to explain them. They're adding type classes. Uh, Read-only struct members, I could probably explain that. But uh, And then params of span of t. So remember the thing I said earlier, that they had this way of representing a chunks of data? They want to represent chunks of data with the params. I don't really understand how that would work, because that would just be a longer chunk of data. So. Who knows? And then static local functions. So you can use normal local functions in the uh, current version of C Sharp 7.3. And then they're doing statics as well. There's a, I think there's a performance difference in doing them static. Who knows? And then they want to add and and is equal and or or is equal assignment operators, just like the one with uh, question mark, question mark equals. So a lot of features, right? There's. Uh, Ranges, async streams and enumerables, record types, target type new expressions, default in construction, generic attributes, color attribute, expression, 
color expression attribute, enhance usings and pattern-based usings, default interface methods, nullable reference types, null coalescing assignments, switch expressions, using declarations, declaration expressions, dictionary literals, type classes, and that thing, static local functions, params of span of t, read-only struct members, negated condition if statements, and then null conditional await. That's kind of a lot. Just took me 30 seconds to name all the features. That's a lot of features to add to the language. So don't imagine all of them being added with the next version, right? Some of them will probably end up being in the a point release. So that's one of the things that you can do with Roslyn. They can ship new releases of the compiler without having to ship major versions of Visual Studio. So they can ship a version with just a, a minor update of Visual Studio, which is great. Or you can even go down to GitHub, and when they've implemented the features, you can use your Visual Studio compiler to compile a new compiler and replace the one inside Visual Studio. And don't do that. Because if not everyone on your team uses the latest compiler, well, stuff will break. So that's not so very good, right? But this is kind of proving the power of Roslyn. We haven't even talked about the features that they did add from 6 on to 8, right? That's a handful of features as well. So because of the, the work they did, which is probably the best thing ever to rewrite the compilers, they're now able to add all these different features. I just hope they're capable of adding things and changing things in the runtime as well, which is kind of the effort be behind you know, .NET Core. But if they can do that, maybe they can fix things that are broken from, by the design. Uh, maybe they could have, if they, if they had done this work prior to building async and await, maybe they would have implemented async and await differently and we would have skipped out on a lot of different edge cases when working with that. So now I reckon that if we look at C-sharp 1 to 7.3, we have this really complete thing of this is a great language to work in, and we've, all of us have probably worked in C-sharp for a long time and really like the features. I, like, I remember when working with the first versions of async and await, I'd worked with C-sharp for many years by then, but when they added that to the language, it changed drastically how I built my applications, right? And then they add things like uh, record types, hopefully, and they add um, pattern matching and so forth in the next versions, and improvements to pattern matching and the switch expressions to make it easier for us to build applications that maybe look a little bit more like Kotlin or Swift or other great languages as well. And I don't think it's a bad idea to look at other, other languages. Like the other languages look at, at the C Sharp language as well, right? So we see all of these different features being added to the language, and hopefully the community for the other languages learn a lot from C-sharp as well and take after these great features in their languages as well. Like, I've been doing Kotlin now for, for let's say, seven months. I can't remember when I started out. But I like to jump into different languages, you know, just learn a little bit about them. And I do see a lot of the features in Kotlin that I really like coming over to C-sharp, like the pattern matching things. Really great in Kotlin. We're getting there in C-sharp as well, especially with the switch expressions. That just becomes a lot easier to work with. And it makes the applications interesting to work with as well and easier to, to build reliable and maintainable applications. All right, so that's all of the features in C-sharp 8 and onwards. We've pretty much gone through them all in 45 minutes. If you have any questions, I'll be here for a little bit while longer. Ping me on Twitter if you have any questions. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this. My name is Philip Eckberg, and thank you so much for taking the time to come here.